Are there any questions for any of our speakers? Yes, I have a question it. for Judge Prudenti. Yeah. Uh, very impressed with your uh, admiration, with your pride for Justice Scalia. I was wondering if you felt anything similar when Justice O'Connor was nominated. Yes, I did. I absolutely did. I remember, you know, when I. Uh, yeah, maybe I should stand up and. Thank you. I have to tell you, I did feel very, very similar pride. And let me tell you why. At the time, you know, and as, as a young woman <coughs> in the law, um, you felt very disenfranchised. I'll, I'll tell you a brief story that I think everyone here would appreciate. I remember my first job out of law school. Now, you have to remember, I went to law school in Europe. Uh, you know, I spent some time a semester at Oxford, Edinburgh, and ended up in Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland. So when I came back, I had a hard time getting a job. I'll be very honest with you. I didn't think I would come back. I thought I'd be an international lawyer. But as a typical Italian, I came very homesick and I missed my family. <laughs> so I did come home. But with, with Justice O'Connor, the feeling was, in that time in Suffolk County, there had never been a woman elected to countywide office and to um, judicial office, nor had there ever been a woman elected in the 10th Judicial District, which is Nassau, Suffolk County, never been a woman elected to the Supreme Court. So I remember having this discussion with my father before she was elected, where he was, you know, he was one of those great people who could give you great inspiration. You know, you could be the next surrogate. Oh, yeah, Dad, there's never been a woman elected to anything here in Suffolk County. Um, you could do this, you could do that. But what the, what the, what the positions that Justice Scalia rose to and Justice O'Connor rose to, I think encouraged more people and more individuals from all different walks of life than we can ever imagine. And the answer, Professor, to your question is yes, absolutely. Another watershed moment in my career. Yes. Uh, Professor Siegel, the problem I have always had with these sort of simplified attitudinal models of the court is that they are one dimensional. When we study Congress, for example, we don't do that. When you assign uh, sort of ideology scores in Congress, political science to do this, they use a two-dimensional model. It's not possible to capture the sort of uh, patterns of their voting on just one dimension. And it seems to me that a one-dimensional model of judges eliminates almost all of the information you would actually want to know about studying in court. So for example, this one-dimensional score cannot tell us that, for example, Justice Alito and Justice Scalia could not have more different views about criminal justice. They are almost nothing alike on that subject. This kind of one-dimensional model can't tell us that Justice Kagan and Justice Ginsburg, two liberals, both appointed by Democrats, have almost nothing in common when it comes to statutory interpretation, where Justice Kagan and Justice Scalia have way more in common than either of them do with Justice Ginsburg or Justice Breyer. They can't tell us that Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas on administrative law, a rather important subject, have completely divergent views. I just wonder why is it that we use a simple kind of one-dimensional zero to one score for liberal versus conservative ideology, not something a little richer that would tell us something about the substance and the differences that these justices have with each other? Well, the answer is that people have tried to look at uh, multiple dimensions. And when you do scaling analyses such as these, it's always the case that you add more dimensions, you can explain more. The question is, how much more? Is it worth the addition of a separate dimension? So in Congress, there used to be a second dimension that was really sort of a north-south civil rights dimension. But over time, that has disappeared because the, uh, the, uh, uh, the anti-civil rights position is now in line with the conservatives. It used to be the Democrats who were anti-civil rights. Now it's, it's more often than not the Republicans. So it's always, you know, you can always explain more. It's a question of how much more. And the people who have done these analyses find that there is, you know, very, very little that's added to the Supreme Court by putting a second dimension in. So it, it, you wouldn't do it just because you know, uh, Kagan and Ginsburg differ on this. It would have to be a, a consistent thing across many justices. Interesting. Thanks. You're welcome. Excuse me. Would you please be kind and elaborate 
for a minute on the statement that it was not Justice Thomas that followed Justice Scalia, but the reverse. Would you elaborate on that? Sure. Just for a moment, please. Yes. Um, Justice uh, Thomas is a much stronger originalist than Justice Scalia. And Scalia started pushing originalism more after uh, Thomas came on the court. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Professor Siegel said this last night at dinner too, and I just find this assertion unfathomable. <laughs> Justice Thomas is not an intellectual. Justice oh. Scalia is an intellectual. <laughs> Justice Scalia has been the intellectual force behind originalism. When Justice Thomas was a baby, Scalia was an intellectual force behind originalism. So the fact that Justice Thomas does not temper his originalism with stare decisis like Justice Scalia does, does not mean that Scalia is somehow subordinate to Thomas in this originalism hierarchy. The fact that Scalia may have mentioned the words originalism more frequently after a certain date in the database when Thomas gets on the court, again, does not mean that Scalia is following Thomas. Scalia wrote the books on originalism. It's a matter of interpretation. He's got a lot of law review articles predated Justice Thomas's time on the court. And so I just, I think looking at the database can sometimes obscure the richer nuances of, of these things. Well, again, it, uh, as I responded last night, uh, I think it's Robert Bork who created originalism in that 1973 Indiana Law Journal article, which was long before <laughs> Scalia took it up. Yes, uh, no one's a Scalia invented originalism, but I think he has been the intellectual powerhouse behind it. Uh, I mean, he was a much more prominent spokesperson for the theory. I have a question. Uh, you know, when I was a government major at Cornell, they had done a, uh, there was an interesting paper on the Supreme Court, and uh, it was you know we, we back then uh, uh, we we took courses on the Supreme Court as part of our uh, distribution in government. And uh, the paper showed that scholars of the court were no better at predicting 5-4 decisions than the flip of a coin, it was about 50-50. Then they had psychologists looking at their value scale, and their predictability went up to like 75%, which is sort of like ideology, I guess, because it, it studies the core values, because we all pick and choose them. You know, at, at the end, whatever we do, is a reflection of our upbringing, whether we like it or not. We, we, we're programmed in a certain way. Even if we want to be objective, but that objectivity comes from our upbringing in many ways. And even for court, they have so many decisions that they can pretty much pick what they want. And uh, I, I'm wondering if that's the same thing, really, this, this ideology versus the psychological profiling of the individual, how non-lawyers could predict better than lawyers which way they're going to go. And those days, of course, there, there, were, there were a lot of 5-4 decisions. And maybe they weren't as polarized as now. I don't know. Well, a, a, a former co-author of mine did this, uh, issued a challenge to law professors about predicting Supreme Court decisions in the coming term. And uh, they did not, the law professors did not do as well as a computer model that my <laughs> co-author had done. Which showed what? What was the computer model based on? It was based on uh, one-dimensional ideology. So uh, the thing about the ideology, again, is as you saw for the current justices on the current court, the correlation using this one dimension of ideology and their voting on the court is about 0.95. You, you can't do any better than that. Right. But isn't it unfortunate that Justice Scalia was paired with uh, uh, Justice uh, Bork, uh, who is an ideologist, you know, in a, in a practical sense, while Justice Scalia is more of a jurist and his position, conservative as it may be, is colored by a thinking that is uh, is not necessarily that of a practitioner or, or you know. Why was he always paired with Bork? 
Um, I, I don't know. I haven't paired him before. <laughs> no, you <laughs> haven't. But the society had. Well, because even, he was he even was President uh, Reagan. Yeah. So after um, Bork was rejected, it was uh, Scalia and Rehnquist who got the next two nominations. Mm -hmm. So chronologically, they were together. They were both very <laughs> conservative, um, and uh, um, uh, Bork was. Uh, the prime proponent of originalism, and Scalia took that up too. I can just add a, add a point on the law professors versus the computers. The, the most famous study I've seen on this, and maybe a different one than the one that you just cited to us, uh, the computers beat the law professors in predicting how the Supreme Court would rule on next term's cases, but the computer only be the law professors because the computer somehow figured out more readily what Justice O'Connor and Justice Kennedy would do. They were worse than the professors in figuring out what Scalia and Ginsburg would do. And that's because when you just look at ideology and you don't look at the nuance of what the text says, for example, uh, I think you can be very easily misled on what someone who has principles jurisprudential principles will do when they get a case, as opposed to someone who doesn't really have a set of objective principles and therefore is left to just do whatever seems right in that particular case. Scalia had principles, and I can tell you firsthand as one of his former law clerks, there were plenty of times when he said to me, Brian, I never thought I would be voting this way, but I have to vote this way, because the text of the statute says this, and our hands are tied. And, and I know there were plenty of votes that he wished he didn't have to cast, but uh, the law was clear enough that he had no choice. And, and so um, I just think it's too simplistic just to focus on ideology, at least for a judge like Scalia who had objective principles that he tried very hard to follow. Certainly we could point to, say, the flag burning cases or the uh, confrontation clause cases as circumstances where Scalia did not vote consistently with his ideology, but overwhelmingly he did. I mean, those, those few cases don't counteract the large majority of his votes that were consistent with it. And, and if I may point out uh, examples where it did not go along with the text, uh, the 11th Amendment cases, where he would apply sovereign immunity to suits by a citizen of the state against the citizen's own state when the 11th Amendment explicitly talks about citizens of one state not being allowed to sue other states. And it's only if you think you can understand text without context. So the, the 11th Amendment refers to a, a certain class of cases because that was the certain class of cases the U.S. Supreme Court messed up on. And so the framers of the 11th Amendment wanted to correct the, the mess up. The, the background context was they did not want any of those suits against states to, to be viable. But Scalia has often said, we go by what they say, not by what they intend. Yeah, but he's not an idiot. And he understands the text and all interpret interpreted in context. Yeah. Any textualist would tell you, you have to know the context around the words. Words are meaningless in a vacuum. They all grow up in a, in a context. So in, in his recent book, I, I don't want to take up all the time. <laughs> but in his recent book, in espousing textualism, he said that if a statute said that no vehicle may enter a park, that that includes an ambulance that needs to go in that would be prohibited to save somebody's life. Because the text of the statute said it prohibits uh, vehicles from entering a park. Yes, but the, the justice believed you had to look at, say, a dictionary around the time just down what those words mean. You can't just know the meaning of the words in a vacuum. The context matters. And so, you know, there might be a, a different situation. What about a a lawnmower that the city wanted to use to mow the lawn in the park. I mean, are you going to say that that's excluded as well? We have to look at the context of the situation. And so uh, I just think it's, it's too easy to say that he was inconsistent for looking beyond the words when he wanted to understand what those words meant at the time that they were put in there. Um, I just think it's, I think it's too easy. OK, I think there's also one question in the back, too. Before. Yes. My question has to do with punishment and the death penalty. Uh, having participated in the last death penalty case in New York State, which we won the penalty phase, I was wondering what 
Justice Scalia thought about the death penalty and particular as to certain states, i.e. Texas, in which a lot of people are executed or are accused of crimes. And in terms of the appellate review, did he think it went on too long? Was there too much time involved? Or did he think that uh, it required a careful review? Judging. Well, I, I know uh, one of the articles that I read and one of the things that Justice Scalia basically <coughs> found that capital punishment was around at the time of the, in the Constitution and that if people were going to take away the rights of the states or the federal government to execute people, they must do it by uh, constitutional amendment. Now, there have been cases, and just recent cases out of the Supreme Court, dealing with the lethal injection question, et cetera. Uh, and the, the United States, the federal government still can, uh, in, we, in federal court, the jury has the right to decide death penalty. Uh, we had a case in the Eastern District of New York uh, before uh, Judge Garufus, uh, uh, who's an Eastern District federal judge, lives out in Queens. And in his case, it was a New York City police officer who was part of a federal task force who was shot and killed in the line of duty. And instead of the city of uh, the state courts in New York taking the case, uh, the federal government, the U.S. Attorney's Office, took the case because they knew that a federal jury sitting in Brooklyn could give the death penalty. And one of the things, uh, I, I, as a sitting judge, really can't tell you my view on the death penalty, but our highest court, the state of New York, declared that our state's death penalty law was <laughs> unconstitutional uh, because of the fact that if the jury didn't give death, then it would still be up to the judge to give life, et cetera. So the Court of Appeals, in a very well-reasoned opinion, said our law was unconstitutional. And our state legislature, the Senate, and the Assembly of the State of New York has not seen fit to reintroduce new death penalty uh, legislation in the State of New York. Uh, and uh, it's probably, a, a, the, I, I would think <coughs> that Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, would take pretty much the same position as his dad, Mario uh, Cuomo, who was my professor. Mario uh, Cuomo was my professor at St. John's University School of Law. And he, for moral reasons, felt that the death penalty was uh, unconstitutional. And he said something, I remember him saying something one time when he was governor, that he thought that if you had sentenced somebody to life imprisonment without the opportunity of any type of parole, that would be a harsher sentence than having a lethal injection. Uh, and as, as, as a sitting judge in the criminal term of the Supreme Court, uh, our former chief judge, uh, Judith Kaye, had a requirement that sitting judges have to uh, visit uh, a prison every four years, uh, if judges in the criminal term. So I, I have happened to visit prisons. And uh, I think personally, if someone told me I was going to be in a maximum security prison in the state of New York for the rest of my life, I think I'd rather have taken a lethal injection. I, I mean that personally. I, instead of uh, <coughs> living that life, and, and knowing I'll never get out of here uh, except in a box, um, you know. So uh, the the death penalty, we still have it, and I think Justice Lee, maybe one of his uh, Brian could even comment on that. That what I read was he said, if you're going to do it, you do it by change uh, an amendment to the Constitution. One judge, I think it was Alito, recently said. What's wrong? What, you know, uh, if, if, you, if you can't get the drugs to do a lethal uh, injection, bring back the firing squad. And people were like, aghast. And he said, hey, it's, it's constitutional. It's quick. It's efficient. And you know, one, one guy in that firing squad doesn't have a round in the chamber. So who, who knows whose shot actually killed him? So I mean, there's a whole there's a whole death penalty thing, but I, I think uh, Brian, am I right on that? Yeah. Your judges. Uh, if I just add one, maybe two thoughts on this. So Scalia's view was there was no doubt that the Constitution allowed for the death penalty, and we don't even have to go to the history. We can just look at the text of the Constitution. The text says you can't deprive someone of life without due process. 
That means if you give them due process, you can take away their life. So the death penalty is in the Constitution. And so he thought it was clearly constitutional, and he did not think that death was different. He thought that every criminal case was entitled to the same due process protection. The death penalty didn't mean you had to turn special, special somersaults. Now, if Congress wanted to pass a statute that said you got to do somersaults in death penalty cases, of course you followed that, but the Constitution didn't say you do anything special in death cases, he didn't do it in other, other criminal cases. Now, what were his personal views on the death penalty? Those were his views of what the Constitution says. What are his personal views? Those are much more complicated because he's a devout Catholic. And the Pope in recent years has not liked the death penalty very much. <coughs> if you're interested in how he reconciled his personal views, his Catholicism, his jurisprudential obligations, he wrote a fascinating essay when I clerked for him about 15 years ago in a Catholic magazine called First Things, where he talks about um, God's justice and ours and how he reconciles his Catholicism with death penalty cases. Very, very interesting. I highly recommend it. Just add one thing. First of all, it is a great essay. You should read it. As to the question of delay, he would frequently refer to delay in a death penalty case as a reduction of sentence, to give you a sense of how he felt about the length of the process. Uh, and he was the circuit justice for Texas, right? Which means that you hear all of the emergency stay applications coming out of that state, which is, at least at the time that I was there, comprised the vast majority of executions in the United States. He was quite familiar uh, with the death penalty system and sort of last minute sort of things that happen. Uh, and he like frequently remarked uh, that the delays were I mean that they were quite excessive. Just to suspend that portion. Any comment? I'm I live in Connecticut. They just overturned the death penalty for petty case. They were all headed for that and it was just overturned, which is created and that's sad in a way of war. But they just got voted on that. Any other questions? Yeah. We talk about the death penalty because it's cruel and inhuman. That's what they go by. Could you comment on that? Anything? Anybody? Well, I think I gave my view. <laughs> uh, I, I had my godmother was murdered in Queens Village by a. I was 15 at the time my aunt was uh, murdered uh, within a block of a Lady of Lords church in Queens Village. Uh, and a young man was 16 years old who did it. And uh, I know what being a family member of a person who has been murdered, uh, the sorrow, the pain, the anger, the resentment, and the cry out for justice. And you know, so often in criminal law, uh, we think very much of the uh, rights of the accused and the rights of the convicted. Uh, the appellate division, the second department, uh, which uh, Judge Prudenti was the boss, the presiding judge, they talked about a case, People versus Noti, I think it was, about the four things that go into uh, sentencing, about uh, rehabilitation, punishment, deterrence, society knowing that someone uh, has done something wrong, and the personal characteristics of the convicted person and the chance of redemption. Well, the as I, I, I think uh, people have said, uh, Scalia as a Catholic, uh, Mario Cuomo as a Catholic, a governor of, of this great state, uh, you know, felt morally the state had never had the right, to, the state should not take the life of anyone. Uh, so the fact, I, I think sometimes, as I said before, uh, it, it's quick. It's quick. I mean, so many of us here have been, you know, have gone on to surgery, gone on to anesthesia, and you, and you, you just count from a thousand back or ten back, and by the time you're at seven, you're out of the way. <coughs> so, as far as cruel and inhuman, uh, I don't know. Uh, that's uh, a decision that courts have looked at. I mean, I think Justice Alito just recently uh, uh, wrote on it, but uh, from. Uh, uh, I can say as a, as a sitting judge, as a judge who does sit on eight felonies, uh, 
which would have been capital offenses possibly. Uh, personally, I'm, 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 I'm very satisfied with the status of our law in the state of New York. So that's all I can say about that. I don't know if anybody else wants to address it. <laughs> Can I ask one more question before we go? I just want to ask the question. Just I cannot let this pass. I just want to ask this question. So you said in your presentation that if the government stopped forcing people to pay union dues, it would be the end of unions. It would hurt them enormously. Oh, just hurt them. Okay. Yeah, I, I may have. Because I just wanted to school. clarify that there are, in fact, half of the states in this yes. country where that yes. is not, in fact, required. But it, it would and have. In fact, a, unions still exist in those states. Right, but they are much weaker than. Okay. Than but they're still others. around. <laughs> okay, let's give an applause to our speakers because <laughs> these are the You still get very excited about it. Yes, this is an exciting, really, uh, event. Um, I, yeah, we put together an outstanding conference for today. Uh, this is just the beginning. Oh, there are two more sessions later on. Uh, the first session in the afternoon will be with the law clerk of Judge Scavia. And then we are going to have from Italy, judges from Italy, who are going to at the Italian perspective. Um, we are, uh, just to the speakers, we are recording this conference. And so we need your permission, and please, afterwards, if you have your permission, you must assign it. Uh, if you don't want us to record your talk, then let us know, please, and we'll not do it. But we, you must release for us a written statement that it's okay. Okay. Maybe you want to clarify that it will be also on YouTube. It's, it's also on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. I'm not on there, am I? Why not? Why not? Oh, no. Take me uh, Okay. Be sure you're not. Fair more. Fair more. Stop. <laughs>